Welcome to World War II in Popular Culture. My name is Laura Bailey and today we will specifically discuss terminology used during the Second World War. It is important to understand that terms and phrases transcend time. This lecture will take an in-depth look at how this era's language remains deeply rooted in society 75 years later. Early in the war, author Jonathan E. Leiter already realized the impact wartime language would have on future generations. One of his quotes states, World War II may be remembered for a number of reasons, and probably the least of these is that it provided a king-sized fund of new slang for the diversion of lexicographers, dictionary writers. We should understand from this statement that men and women from all over the country, coming out of rural and industrial areas, different social and economic status, various ethnicities and cultures united for a common purpose. The mixture of these humanities set the nation on a new course in many areas. To give you a fun example of how language can dramatically change over the years, here is a quote from Francis Raymond Meyer from 1942. Tell that apple knocker to stop bulldogging the belly robber's bomb heaver, or he'll soon be a china clipper, the big zombie. I have yet to meet anyone that can translate that for me in this modern era. The translation in today's English serves as a warning stating, Tell that upstate hick to quit dancing with the mess sergeant's beautiful girl, or he'll soon be a dishwasher, the big clown. Today we will focus upon three areas. The common link between them is they are easily recognizable and familiar in our popular culture. We will review some examples of entertaining and interesting terms, followed by ones that are very serious in context, and close with phrases that remain in common use today. It is common for individuals to lighten dark situations by nicknaming them. In some cases, simplification is the reason for creating monikers. The term GI was an abbreviation used in place of the Army phrase government issued. It initially applied to equipment, but eventually expanded to cover the soldier as well in an often resentful and sarcastic tone perhaps due to the feelings of entrapment while serving one's country. As with the GI, the term Jeep results from a particular vehicle produced for the war. Also known as an army mule, this general purpose GP vehicle became known as a Jeep. We are all familiar with them. Further expanded upon, the reference to a CJ Jeep simply means civilian Jeep. Turning to another term with a dual result of emotion, depending upon the circumstances, is there are no atheists in foxholes. Pictured left is First Sergeant William Harris. Upon interviewing him five years ago, he shared this phrase with me as he giggled. As the conversation continued, I became aware that he was at Hickam Field, Hawaii on December 7, 1941. At the war's end, he was in Okinawa, in a foxhole. There he remained for two straight days until he and his unit believed the news of the war's end was not propaganda. In that brief transition in his story, the phrase took on a more reverent tone. As language takes on a serious tone, it is vital to pay close attention to the jargon used in jest or with malicious intent. With the extreme shifts of focus and traditional roles in America during World War II, the female gender became a target for misogynistic views and slander. Pictured on the left shows the typical depiction of women at the start of the war. Referred to as aprons, Society viewed the woman's place was in the kitchen. As more and more men deployed for action, the need for the female gender to move out of the kitchen became more important. Women were running factories and flying aircraft, giving them confidence and purpose while making some males resentful and threatened, thus leading to slurs like powder puffs. After the war ended, the definition of traditional roles changed. Women wanted more than that of a housewife. Those fighting against the evolution of the female fought back with words like feminazi. This term rose to popularity in the 90s when used by political commentator Rush Limbaugh in his references to extreme feminism. Feminazi quickly segued into a very disparaging remark paralleling equality with Hitler's evil desire for the annihilation of the Jewish population. The hatred resonating from like words and phrases evokes extreme emotions within most individuals. Similarly, mass and violent death envelop many with other emotions. At the mere mention of these next two terms, the natural response is a combination of fear, repulsion, and grief. The birth of the phrase atomic age 
came into our vocabulary on August 6, 1945, as the United States forever changed the definition in extremes of war by using the first nuclear weapon on Hiroshima. Estimates specify that between 90,000 and 146,000 lives perished as a result. As incredibly horrific as these deaths were, the total numbers pale compared to those lost to genocide the term given to Hitler's determination to annihilate a race by Raphael Lemkin in October 1944. Approximately 6 million Jews lost their lives by a systematic death process at the hands of the Nazis. The feelings of anguish and despair continue to reverberate 75-plus years later. Although these terms are specific to the war era, they each continue to conjure up emotions of prejudice, fear, and extreme discrimination. They are timeless in that respect thus finding their place in the modern day. In this modern era, we find ourselves approximately four generations removed from those who actually lived during World War II, and yet their coined phrases remain with us in many ways. Some have stood the test of time, while others are recalled and made famous again when applicable in modern history. Victory Gardens, for one, recently regained notoriety in a CBS Sunday Morning report regarding America's interest in growing fresh vegetables at home in response to the coronavirus epidemic. Another retro to modern motivator is Rosie the Riveter. Her popularity then and now serve as an inspiration to all with an empowering statement of we can do it. Finally, we will refer to the Britons and their 1939 motivational poster in preparation for World War II, stating, keep calm and carry on. It recently regained popularity through a variety of slogans and memes throughout social media and advertisements. These are reminders to the masses to remain steadfast and press forward, thus proving the power and longevity of words. There can never be an accurate measure of the power that words contain. More time could easily allow for a more contextualized analysis of the variations of military jargon, propaganda slogans, and home front slang. Without a doubt, most everyone, even our youngest generations, uses some form of speech deriving from this era. As referenced in the previous slides, the use of language can create a multitude of varying responses. Words and monikers can create laughter, strengthen, motivate, instill fear, condemn, and trigger recollections of better or worse times. Often phrases and slogans take hold in society and resonate deeply within a group of people leading to calls for change. Words can unite and divide. With this thought, I ask you to consider the days you are living and reflect upon terms specific to your era. I also encourage everyone to listen to how you speak. Take the time to understand what you say, why you say it, how it often rolls off the tongue without a thought, and consider the implications felt by those receiving your words. Investigate the origins. In some cases, it may be disturbing and other times fascinating. You should also be aware that today will be the history future generations study. It is with this thought I close with some very famous words uttered by William Faulkner. The past is never dead. It's not even past. Thank you.